Deception, slavery, and unimaginable cruelty. There are many companies with dark origin stories, but the story of Volkswagen may be the most horrifying. Today, the Volkswagen Group is one of the largest auto conglomerates in the world, holding ownership over brands like Audi, Bentley, Lamborghini, and Porsche. You might associate Volkswagen with some of the most beloved car designs, like the harmless looking Volkswagen Beetle or the playful VW bus. However, behind the innocent facade of these iconic cars lies one of the darkest histories in the world of business, dating all the way back to Nazi Germany and a personal request from Adolf Hitler. Be warned, this story is not for the faint of heart. This is a story of dark secrets. This is the disturbing true story of Volkswagen. After Germany lost World War I, the German economy was on the brink of collapse. To make up for the damage caused by the war, Germany was forced to pay an astounding amount of money in reparations to other European countries. The amount was a total of 132 billion gold marks, more than $500 billion in today's money. As a consequence, the German economy was extremely volatile during the 1920s. Unemployment was sky high, and because the government printed endless amounts of money to pay for reparations, Germany's currency became essentially worthless. During the winter, it was actually cheaper to burn your cash to stay warm than it was to buy firewood. The German people were desperate for something to change, and this was exploited by the Nazi party, who by 1933 managed to gain nearly absolute power, leading to Adolf Hitler becoming Germany's chancellor. Hitler promised to restore the German economy to its former glory, and to do that, he needed to make it completely self-sufficient. One of the ways Hitler planned to do this was to connect German cities with a large highway network known as the Autobahn. So he ordered the Nazi government to start building thousands of miles of road across Germany. But once the Autobahn was ready, there was one problem. There weren't any cars on it. You see, even though the economy showed signs of improvement, cars were still a luxury in the 1930s, so buying a brand new one was totally out of reach for most working class Germans. However, since the turn of the 20th century and the introduction of automobiles, German engineers had dreamed of a vehicle that was small, easy to mass produce, and inexpensive to buy. The idea had a popular name, the people's car, or as it was said in German, Volkswagen. Some promising designs had been introduced over the years, although none of them had ever reached a mass market. But Hitler wanted to change that to fill up the Autobahn, so he recruited a man who was already a titan of the car industry, Ferdinand Porsche, one of Porsche's founders. Porsche had designed some of Germany's most iconic cars to date, so Hitler considered him the perfect man to bring his personal idea for the Volkswagen to life. Hitler wanted a small family car that could fit two adults in the front and three children in the back. It had to be light, fuel efficient, and able to clear 100 kilometers an hour on the Autobahn. Hitler also told Porsche, it should look like a beetle. And Hitler even made his own sketches. Now, if there was anyone in Germany you didn't want to displease, it was Adolf Hitler. So Ferdinand got straight to work, using inspiration from his most successful past designs, like the Porsche Type 12 and Type 32. However, potential designs for the people's car had been in the works for decades already, and some of them looked suspiciously close to Ferdinand's final design. Years later, one engineer was able to successfully sue Volkswagen and get partial credit for the design, so it's fair to say the design for the first Volkswagen wasn't completely original. But either way, by 1938, the Volkswagen's design was ready, Hitler loved it, and the new Volkswagen factory in Wolfsburg was about a year away from starting production. Now, even though Ferdinand became Volkswagen's president, it was a state-owned company at the time, so it was founded under the Nazi government, and they were in charge of advertising the new people's car to the German population. Hitler priced it at 990 German Reichsmarks, a little over $6,000 in today's money, and he initially named the car the KDF Wagen, as in Germany, KDF was an abbreviation of strength through joy. But since the Volkswagen factory wasn't quite ready yet, and since many Germans were still struggling financially, the Nazis came up with the idea of a savings booklet. If citizens paid 5 Reichsmarks every week until they reached the full price of 990, then they could get their Volkswagen in a little under 4 years, when the full amount was paid off. 5 Reichsmarks a week was a reasonable rate for most working class Germans, and so over 300,000 Germans signed up. But none of them ever got their Volkswagen, and all of their hard earned savings would be lost. Because in 1939, the Third Reich invaded Poland, marking the beginning of World War II. And throughout the course of the war, Volkswagen would reveal just how evil it could truly be.
Because of the war, the Volkswagen factory had to be entirely repurposed to aid in Germany's war effort. It was really a weapons factory disguised as a car factory, because the Nazis didn't tell the German public that they would have to wait, and instead, all of the money they paid for their cars was used by the Nazis to fund the war. Hitler had initially planned the Volkswagen factory to build the people's car, which fit two adults and three children, but now, the factory was making military vehicles that needed to fit, in Hitler's words, three men and a machine gun. As the war intensified, most German men were employed by the Nazis either as soldiers, military officers or policemen, so there was a massive shortage of industrial workers at the Volkswagen factory. To make up for this, Ferdinand suggested to Hitler that they use Soviet and Polish prisoners of war to operate the factory whilst World War II raged on, and Hitler personally signed off on building Wolfsburg's first concentration camp, which was directly attached to the factory. At one point, there were four concentration camps and eight forced labour camps in Wolfsburg, all there to operate the Volkswagen factory. Tens of thousands of men and women worked in the factory during the war, basically as slaves. And since Porsche so strongly believed in the Nazi racial hierarchy, the workers were treated extremely unfairly. The Scandinavians were given more rations than the Poles, the Poles were given more rations than the Russians, and the Russians were given more rations than the Jews. But even though some got better treatment than others, all of Volkswagen's workforce was hungry, cold, and overworked. And yet, a lack of food was nothing compared to the tragedies that occurred in the children's home at the Volkswagen factory, or as it was called, the Kinderheim. You see, before 1943, the Nazis' policy at their forced labour camps was to send women who got pregnant back to their hometowns. But every time this happened, Volkswagen lost one of its workers. So they asked the Nazis to modify this policy. And as a result, the Nazis instituted nurseries for newborn babies and sent the mothers straight back to the camps to continue working. And thus, Volkswagen's Kinderheim was built in a town just outside the factory. Now, it's important to note that Volkswagen was directly responsible for running the Kinderheim, not the Nazis. So the mothers had every reason to believe that their babies would be well cared for. But sadly, they were wrong. To even visit their children, the mothers had to get a police permit every time, and if they were expecting the Kinderheim to be a well-equipped nursery, it was instead just two old run-down wooden barracks. The Kinderheim was completely infested with cockroaches, flies, maggots, bedbugs and lice, which would all crawl over the babies at night and bite their faces. Their diapers were hardly ever changed, and 15 babies would be showered in contaminated water at the same time and cleaned off with the same dingy towel. But even worse, the staff didn't make a single effort to care for the babies. The Kinderheim's doctor never examined their condition, and only showed up there once every week for a few minutes. The nurses were no good either. Even though the other mothers begged them to close the Kinderheim's windows at night so the babies wouldn't sleep in the cold, the nurses just flatly refused. One of them told the staff that they shouldn't even bother feeding the babies, so they were only given a half litre of spoiled milk and one and a half sugar cubes each day. When asked about the Kinderheim later on, one of the mothers said, I couldn't do anything to relieve the suffering of my child, but watch over him stealthily and weep, seeing the unlimited misery of those human beings. You see, Volkswagen was faced with a choice about what to do with these babies. They could either wait for them to grow into adults and force them to work in the factory, or they could just kill them. And not only did Volkswagen choose the second option, but they chose to kill them with more cruelty than even some of the Nazis. In fact, one Nazi official came to assess the situation at the Kinderheim and reported that, The present handling of the problem is appalling in my opinion. There are ways to handle this without pain and suffering. But one of the Kinderheim staff members just brushed off his suggestion sarcastically, saying that the baby was merely tortured. As you would expect, the constant malnutrition, infection and neglect meant that death was a weekly event at the Kinderheim, and Volkswagen made the mothers pay for their funerals. Although perhaps funeral is not the right word for it. The baby's bodies were wrapped in toilet paper, stored in the Kinderheim's bathroom for a few days, and then tossed into an unmarked mass grave inside of a cardboard box. In the end, somewhere between 365 to 400 babies were victims to this tragic fate. The death rate for infants inside Volkswagen's Kinderheim was nearly 100%. And this would have continued for longer, but then in 1945, the Allies had successfully advanced into Germany's territory, and they bombed the Volkswagen factory as a strategic move. The factory was left in ruins, but the bombing was a sign of hope. Over at the Kinderheim, Volkswagen ordered one of the bureaucrats to burn all of their documents. But in an act of sudden bravery, he took a stack of blank papers and burned those instead. That's how we know about all the atrocities that occurred at the Volkswagen factory and the Kinderheim. 
The 9,700 workers and concentration camp inmates working on the Volkswagen factory at the time were liberated by the Allies. And a few weeks later, in May 1945, the Nazis surrendered. World War II was finally over. But now that the Nazis were out of the picture, what was going to happen to Volkswagen? After the war, Germany was a broken nation. The Allied powers and the Soviet Union occupied the entire territory, and now their task was to figure out how to rebuild Germany so it could participate in the global economy again. Now, the Volkswagen factory used to be the biggest employer in the town of Wolfsburg, but after the Allies bombed it, it was left in ruins. If the factory didn't resume production, the people of Wolfsburg would be left without food and housing. So the British army tasked Major Ivan Hurst with the administration of the Volkswagen factory. Ivan was a British army officer and engineer, but he was just 29 years old at the time. And when he got a tour of what remained after the bombing, Ivan knew saving Volkswagen was going to be very complicated. About two thirds of the factory's roof had been torn down, there were massive bomb craters all over the floor, and much of the machinery had been damaged. But still, Ivan knew the factory could employ at least some of the people of Wolfsburg for now. And he also realised that there was an extra benefit to the Volkswagen factory. All of the British Army's vehicles were in terrible conditions after six years of war. So because Volkswagen's cars were designed to be easy to mass produce, it could become the main transportation vehicle for the British Army while they occupied Germany. And by sheer coincidence, it just so happened that there was one prototype Volkswagen in the factory that had miraculously been unharmed during the bombings. So Ivan painted it like an army vehicle and sent it to the British Army's headquarters. And to his surprise, they sent him back an order for 20,000 other cars just like it. And 14 days later, they doubled the order to 40,000. But in Ivan's words, an order for the cars was one thing, to produce them was another. You see, the factory was in shambles, and its equipment was damaged. So at first, Ivan was only able to get the Volkswagens built manually, which was a very slow process. Also, the vast majority of the labourers who worked at the Volkswagen factory returned to their home countries after they were liberated. And finally, since Germany's industrial economy had collapsed after the war, getting materials like glass, steel and car batteries was extremely difficult. So Ivan put his head down and started tackling all these problems one by one. Once they cleaned up all the rubble and repaired the equipment, Ivan managed to organise assembly lines that produced Volkswagens much faster. To make up for the lack of workers, Ivan called the British Army and asked them to release Nazi prisoners of war and give them a job in the factory. And finally, to get a good supply of materials, Ivan cut a deal with the Allied powers to give him a steady ration of steel, glass and other materials. With all of this combined, by the end of 1946, the factory was up and running. It had produced its first 10,000 cars and the number was only increasing from there. Throughout all of this time, Ivan continually made improvements, including the introduction of motorised flat wagons to move parts around the factory. And this led to a surprising development. They soon realised that if they made some modifications to the flat wagon, it could be sold to the general public as well. So eventually, that project turned into the hugely popular Volkswagen Type 2, which is more commonly known by its nicknames, including the VW Bus, the Camper, or the Bully. Once Ivan fulfilled his quota of 40,000 Type 1s for the British Army, he established a network of successful car dealerships around Germany and other places in Europe. And the British Treasury even ordered that the factory begin to export cars to the UK. Of course, the original Volkswagen logo was changed to get away from its Nazi origins. But it was clear to Ivan that the company had a bright future. They were selling cars all over Europe now, and the Volkswagen Type 1 actually became a symbol of Germany's resurrection. Ivan had inherited what appeared to be a lost cause. And yet just a few years later, Volkswagen had a working factory, two star products, an entire team, and a network of dealerships. And so by 1949, once the Allies had managed to get Germany to a good enough situation that they were ready to let it be a sovereign nation again, Ivan's job was finally complete. It was time to hand off Volkswagen to the people of Germany. And this is where Volkswagen's path to domination truly begins. Okay, so we've just seen Volkswagen get totally rebuilt and turned into a successful business. But what if you wanted to start or grow your own business? That's where today's sponsor Kajabi can help you. Kajabi is the ultimate all-in-one platform that helps creators and entrepreneurs build successful online businesses. Kajabi lets you turn your skills into online courses, membership sites, coaching, and more. You don't need any tech experience. There's customizable templates, and Kajabi makes it really simple to build something great and start accepting payments. 
I've actually been building my own YouTube course entirely using Kajabi, from the sales page, to the membership area, to the mailing list. Normally I'd need a bunch of different subscriptions for all that, but Kajabi handles everything I need in one place. And because I wanted to make sure my course was the best it could be, I tried loads of different course platforms. But Kajabi was by far my favourite, and let me add all the customizations and features I wanted. In fact, there are thousands of creators on Kajabi making 6 and 7 figures with less than 50k followers. And right now, Kajabi is offering a 30 day free trial to start your own business if you go to kajabi.com slash magnates. That's K-A-J-A-B-I dot com slash magnates. So go to kajabi.com slash magnates to earn more doing what you love. Coming into the 1950s and 60s, the Volkswagen Beetle and the VW bus became something of a global icon. In 1955, Volkswagen celebrated the sale of their 1 millionth Beetle, and it became the world's best-selling car in 1972. Following this success, Volkswagen went on to release even more models, like the Volkswagen Type 3 and Type 4, which were also huge hits. As for the VW bus, it became tightly associated with the counterculture movement against the Vietnam War. So needless to say, Volkswagen's image came a long way from the days of Nazi Germany. It's quite an amazing rebrand to go from a company that began because of Adolf Hitler, to being part of the hippie movement representing peace and love. However, in 1960, Volkswagen was denationalised. So rather than the government owning the whole company, they kept just 20%. And ever since then, Volkswagen has been on a relentless quest to absorb their competition. For example, in 1964, the Volkswagen Group bought a struggling German auto conglomerate known as the Auto Union, and one of the brands included in the deal was Audi. In 1986, Volkswagen bought a majority stake in the Spanish car manufacturer Seat. A year later, they bought out Skoda. And by the turn of the century, Volkswagen had acquired Bentley, Lamborghini, and Bugatti. So by swallowing up as many other car brands as they could, the Volkswagen Group was now a massive and powerful conglomerate. But then in the early 2000s came another twist, as it seemed like it was Volkswagen who was going to get bought out, and by none other than the company that had designed their first car back before World War II, Porsche. By this point, Porsche was the world's most profitable car manufacturer, clearing over 2 billion in profit in 2004. And throughout the years, the two companies had had an important relationship. Porsche owned 5% of Volkswagen, and Volkswagen's CEO owned 10% of Porsche, as he was actually the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche. But in 2005, Porsche bought more Volkswagen shares and increased their stake to 20%, and then slowly but surely, they increased this to over 30%. Now, Porsche's CEO publicly stated they had no intention to take over the company. He said Volkswagen was simply an important partner of theirs. But behind closed doors, Porsche most definitely did want to take over the company. And when the 2008 financial crisis struck and Volkswagen's sales heavily declined, Porsche saw their chance to buy billions of euros of their stock. And under German laws, they didn't have to reveal how much. These consistent investments from Porsche actually kept Volkswagen's stock pretty stable even though the company was really struggling. So to many outside investors, it seemed obvious that Volkswagen's stock was highly overvalued. And as a result, hundreds of hedge funds shorted the stock, believing its value would soon come crashing down. Now, short selling is basically when an investor borrows a company's shares and sells them with the plan to buy them back later at a lower price. If the value decreases like they expect, then investors make a profit on the difference. But in 2008, Porsche dropped a statement that shocked the investing world. They revealed that they now owned 42.6% of Volkswagen's voting stock and held a further 31.5% in options. They also said they were going to keep buying Volkswagen stock until they owned 75% of the company. This meant Volkswagen's stock price was not going down anytime soon. Plus, since the German government still owned around 20% of the stock, there were way less shares available on the open market than investors had realised. And so, all those investors who'd shorted the stock were sent into a panic, and began frantically buying back their Volkswagen shares before it was too late. As a result, within just a couple of days, Volkswagen's share price went from around €210 Euros to over €1,005. Euros. It was described as the biggest short squeeze in history. And for just a couple of days during the panic, Volkswagen became the most valuable company in the world by market capitalization. Now this quickly went back to normal very soon after. But still, Porsche was nearing 75% ownership of Volkswagen, and so their takeover plan seemed on track. But for their last push to own everything, they needed more money, and so they sought the help of a group of Qatari investors. 
However, the German government blocked this deal from going through, and after this, things started to fall apart for Porsche. You see, by buying up so much stock, Porsche had taken on around 10 billion euros in debt. Their plan was that once they had over 75% ownership of Volkswagen, they'd be able to pass a profit transfer agreement and pay off their debt using Volkswagen's cash reserves. In other words, using the money from the company they just bought to help pay for the company they just bought. But once the deal fell through and Porsche were unable to afford the remaining stock they needed to have full control, they now had no way to pay back their debts. And this caused a wave of investors to take their money out of Porsche. Meanwhile, over on Volkswagen's side, they feared Porsche would now start selling off huge amounts of Volkswagen stock to cover their debts. So before they could do that, Volkswagen decided to turn the tables on Porsche. In 2009, Volkswagen asked Porsche's Qatari investors to divert their investment into Volkswagen instead. And with that money, they bought 49.99% of Porsche's stock, just a single share away from 50%. Three years later, Volkswagen bought the remainder of Porsche for 4.45 billion euros. So in a bizarre turnaround, what had started with Porsche trying to buy Volkswagen had ended with Volkswagen buying Porsche. Of course, this did mean Volkswagen had to pay for some of the debts Porsche had taken on. But bringing Porsche into the Volkswagen Group meant they would have an additional 700 million euros in profits every year. And now nobody was threatening Volkswagen with a takeover. They were now an even more powerful conglomerate. And with the financial crisis now over, and Porsche and so many other car brands under their control, things were back on track for Volkswagen. And they were now selling tens of millions of cars every year. And yet, behind all of that success, Volkswagen was hiding a dirty secret. And once it was discovered, it would launch them into the most public scandal in the company's history. Hey guys, I know some of you have been asking when my YouTube course will be ready. It's been in the works for about a year now, as I wanted to make sure it's the best on the market by far. And the good news is, it's now in the final stages. So if you're interested in learning everything I know about writing videos, editing videos, growing a channel, building a team, and how to make lots of money from it, then just click the course link in the description below. The Volkswagen Group was quickly rising to the top of the automobile industry, each year selling more cars than the last. And yet, Volkswagen was hiding an illegal secret inside millions of their cars. It all began around 2009, when Volkswagen started heavily advertising its new clean diesel cars. Up until this point, Volkswagen had had to suspend sales of their diesel cars, as they gave off high quantities of toxic gases that failed environmental regulations. However, their new cars, which used a nitrogen oxide trap to help capture those toxic gases, passed the emissions tests. It was considered a huge success in the industry, even winning environmental awards and helping Volkswagen get tax breaks. Except, it was all a lie. In reality, some of Volkswagen's engineers had secretly added software that silently detected when the car was being tested. During an emissions test, the car was programmed to temporarily switch into a low emission mode where the car would use less gas and give the engine less power, which in turn made the car give off less emissions and be able to pass the emissions test. But as soon as the car was unhooked from the testing computer, it would switch back to normal and the car's exhaust would continue pumping out high levels of nitrogen oxide which is linked with air pollution, acid rain, asthma, cancer, and heart problems. And some Volkswagen cars were actually emitting up to 40 times the amount of toxic gases that US regulators allowed. It was blatant cheating. The cars had been systematically engineered to deceive emissions testing. And yet, this meant that for years, it went completely unnoticed. It wasn't until 2014 that university researchers tested the cars on the road, and were shocked to see how different the results were. At first, they thought the high emissions must be a mistake, but their discoveries alerted US regulators, and thus began the scandal known as Dieselgate. When it became clear that Volkswagen was cheating the emissions test, the US Environmental Protection Agency forced Volkswagen to recall hundreds of thousands of diesel cars with this system installed on them in the US. And in Europe, it was discovered that over 8 million cars had this system as well. US prosecutors described it as an appalling fraud that went to the very top of the company. There are claims at least 30 people at management level had known what was going on for years. And even more shockingly, when this data was first released, VW didn't fix the problem. They tried to fix the device to make it even better at cheating the emissions test. This was not just false advertising, it was fraud. Volkswagen had lied to their customers and caused untold damage to the environment and people's health. 
In total, Volkswagen had sold around 11 million cars with this system on them. So as a result, they had to pay $25 billion to their customers and to regulators in the US, plus an almost 3 billion criminal fine, and nearly 5 billion to mitigate the pollution from all those years. So in total, this scandal cost the Volkswagen Group close to $35 billion. Because of this, Volkswagen reported its first unprofitable quarter in 2015, and their CEO had to step down from his position. Volkswagen also later admitted to gassing live monkeys with diesel fumes as part of a test to try and prove their diesel engines were clean, which they weren't. However, whilst you'd think that Volkswagen would suffer the consequences of this scandal for years to come, just a year later, Volkswagen managed to surpass Toyota to become the world's best-selling car conglomerate. So despite everything, Volkswagen had managed to rise to the very top of the auto industry. In fact, on a list of the 10 best-selling cars in history, Volkswagen has three of them. Given the scandals they've been involved with, this may seem surprising. But I think it's important to stress we can't blame Volkswagen today for the atrocities in its early years. Because after World War II, although the name and factory were the same, the people running the company were completely changed. And when you consider all of the brands the Volkswagen Group owns, there's no doubt they've made plenty of brilliant, iconic cars. But on the other hand, the emissions scandal, along with multiple scandals of bribery involving high-level executives, all show that even Volkswagen's recent history is still filled with controversy. So if you feel like watching a more uplifting story, I suggest checking out how Nintendo saved the video game industry from collapse. Just click the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you there in a second. Cheers.